Across the bay from San Francisco, Alameda Island, a former naval facility now home port to Navy cargo vessels. On this day, it is a testing area for maritime interdiction, operations, and weapons of mass destruction, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. On board the MV Cape Orlando, participants and observers gather at the morning meeting. MPS professor Alex Bordetsky leads the multi-part field experiment. How to put together new counter WMD ISR operations as they unfold based on the small craft threat in the area or cargo ship delivery of the threatful material or the other means of illicit material uh, trafficking into the area of our concern. That's basically the scope of our experimentation. The experiment is supported by Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, technology firms, law enforcement, and defense agencies. The plan is to simulate a nuclear threat at sea and on land, and to use an assortment of technology and tactics to detect and attract radioactive materials. A large laser spectroscopy system rides in the back of a rental truck. Operators roam the port, scanning nearby warehouses for radioactive material. What are you shooting? The fire exit sign inside the building. There's a white fire exit sign on top of it. Oh, yeah. So we may as well be able to interrogate the inside of the building if we can, right? So I shot the door, no threat. Naturally, shot the uh, that sign, no threat. And I'll shoot the frame again. I'm actually shooting, since that door's open, I'm shooting way above everybody's head. The system's boxy design, basic laptop, and video game control pad belie its true capabilities. One laser is triggered to induce plasma on a surface of a target. Another laser stimulates amplified emissions from the plasma that is detected by one or more spectroscopes. The gain induced by the second laser detects traces of explosives and other substances on surfaces. You know, generally fire three times and then you'll get a reading. It gets a hit. PC. The exact range and amount of material that can be detected by the system is held secret. At sea, the Marine unit of the San Francisco Police Department track a small boat suspected of carrying nuclear material. The small boat, in this instance, a Coast Guard auxiliary vessel. Uh, one force here, just pick a heading and hold it for a minute. We're just going to test them real quick. David Trembino of Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory explains. So what we're seeing now is that on the target vessel, we have detected some radiation. You see it continues to go up. And it's turned red, saying it's above our significant trigger level. So now we're seeing this peak in the energy spectrum that tells you information about the source. That's something that by doing an acquire, we have some data we can send to, to reach back. And the way this is rigged is that as soon as it saves that spectrum, it's actually doing a one minute count and by being close we're getting all the information. Um, as soon as the one minute is done, the spectrum is automatically posted on the observer's notepad. Observers reviewing the data at the operations center would coordinate among subject matter experts and advise the boarding team on how to handle a search. Intrigued by the results, Sergeant Keith Matthews coordinates a series of maneuvers to observe different detection results. That's going to be the training tool right there is to say, with this size of a source, we saw we had to get a distance of no greater than X to be able to detect properly or to get the readings we needed. Underwater searches can often be time consuming, not just because of low visibility and other dangers in the water, but because of the inability of communicating without the need for the diver to resurface. Until recently, doing so electronically has been seen as untenable. However, after numerous tests, Bordetsky and his team have shown it is possible. 
The diver, using a wireless device, can send messages and pictures via Bluetooth to the hardwired computer seen here in the red box. The buoy contains a computer hardwired to the second computer placed underwater. An operations tech, either shoreside or remote, would transmit messages and pictures to the hardwired device. The hardwired device relays to the underwater computer, and that computer sends the data via Bluetooth to the diver's wireless device. The method would work in reverse as well. If such a method were perfected with little to no lag time, it would significantly aid in decreasing search times and increasing safety for divers. On this occasion, they also plan to test LEC wire, which can illuminate and transmit data simultaneously. The basis is electroluminescence, but what we have going on here is an LEC. It's a light emitting capacitor. So you can have very, very long lengths that are deployable quickly, easily to put a defended pathway down or to get people to ferry lots of people out along it in a hazmat situation. Uh, they can run along the line and the responders can therefore work on the people that are down that truly need their help. Another advantage to this is that any form of data, calm, control, power, conveyance, can be sent down the middle of this light because the light lives uh, in a cylindrical aspect around it. A search of a large boat would require numerous pieces of technology to quickly detect a threat. A land ROV would be used on deck. An underwater ROV would be used to check the outside of the hull. Another effective tool is the gamma ray germanium imager. This is an image taken of a cobalt-60, a cesium-137, and a uranium source. And in about three to five minutes, we are able to localize the cesium and the cobalt-60 because they have fairly high energy gamma rays. They're fairly act radioactive sources. We can see the uranium. We are able to localize in about 10 minutes. This software also lets us look at the spectral information as well. And from this, we can actually see the unique uh, radiation from each of the isotopes. We can see the cesium-137 along with the bismuth-210 and some radium lines as well. There we go. The U.S. Coast Guard serve as the boarding team and make their way through the vessel. Along the way, members test the communications system using ATAC wearable mesh and relays placed at key points throughout the ship. In the engine room, David Trombino hides the radioactive material. So here's the cesium source, and over here is the cobalt source. A rock in here, this is the smoke detector. The boarding team arrives in the engine room and attempts to contact the bridge. The boarding team must test the room with a radionuclide identification device. They get an instant response. You look surprised. But they have trouble narrowing down where the threat is located. Notably, the brightly colored containers do not stand out among the various worn signs and mechanical equipment. The nuclear material is effectively hidden in plain sight. Oh, you. That's you. <laughs> Maybe it's. Are you a guarantee? There's nothing on her. In any case, searching by sight is not the primary objective. The boarding team must follow their training use the device and ascertain the location of the radioactive material. Because the cesium and cobalt are so near to each other, the radionuclide identification device gives back odd readings. Trombino reassures the team of how to use their equipment to detect the threat. He shows them how a smoke detector can produce a false positive, and he shows them the location of the cesium and cobalt. Much of what Bordetsky's team is attempting is still in the experimental phases. However, gaining the interest of local law enforcement and the Department of Homeland Security, it appears such maritime interdiction operations will remain a crucial learning tool.